Hey everybody, it's Mr. Smeeds, and today we'll be covering topic 5.6, which is pest control. So pesticides are a really effective way to control pests in the short term. They may minimize the amount of crops you lose and they may maximize profits. But we're gonna to talk today about unintended consequences of using pest control. So one of them we already know, we can see it kind of demonstrated here uh, as this crop duster flies over the fields, is we can kill unintended target species with pesticides. Another problem though, which we'll talk about is this idea of pesticide resistance. And so we've got a super bug up in the corner of the screen there to represent that pests can actually become resistant to the pesticides designed to kill them. Our objective for the day is to be able to describe the benefits and drawbacks of pest control. And we need to know that pests can develop what's called pesticide resistance over time if pesticides are overapplied and also that GMOs can be a solution to reduce pesticide use, but they can result in biodiversity loss and that brings some problems we'll talk about. And then finally, the science skill that we'll practice is proposing. A... So first we'll talk about pesticides. Pesticides are chemicals that are toxic to pests and pests are just organisms such as rodents or fungi that may harm crops. And so what we can see here is that we have different pesticides for different types of organisms. We have rodenticides to kill rodents. We have insecticides for insects, herbicides for plants, and fungicides for fungi. And while pesticide use may over the short term decrease the pests that attack crops and increase profits, there are some longer term consequences. Over time, overuse of pesticides can cause the pests to actually evolve resistance. So because there's genetic diversity in the pest populations, some of them naturally have genetic mutations, which give them adaptations that allow them to survive the pesticide. And so over time, pesticide use will actually artificially select for resistant genes in the population. It'll kill all of the organisms that do not have genetic resistance to the pesticide, but it will leave behind only the ones that do have genetic resistance. So over time, the entire population will evolve genetic resistance to that pesticide. Now we call this effect the pesticide treadmill because it's this never ending cycle of having to constantly develop new pesticides because the pests become resistant to the old ones. If we look at a graph here of BT corn use over time, remember that BT corn is genetically modified to produce its own insecticide within the corn. That's gonna actually cause resistant species to increase. So the more we use BT corn, in effect, the more we arm our corn with its own insecticide, the more insects are evolving resistance to this. So now we'll talk about genetic modification, which is another method of pest management. So in genetic modification, the genes of the crop are actually altered to have a gene that codes for a resistant trait added to their genome. So we have the example of BT corn. In BT corn, this corn has actually been given a bacterial gene that allows it to make a BT crystal, which is a type of protein that kills caterpillars and other corn pests. Then we have Roundup Ready soybeans and other crops. These are crops that have a genetic modification that allows them to resist Roundup, which is a really potent herbicide. So in effect, farmers can spray their field with large amounts of Roundup, killing the weeds, but not damaging their Roundup Ready soybeans. If we take a look at this diagram here, this helps us understand a little bit better how the bacterial resistant gene actually helps the BT corn. So we can see there, there's a caterpillar that's munching on that corn leaf, but when we take the gene out of the bacteria and put it into the corn, each plant cell within the corn actually has this BT crystal gene in it now. And so the plant cells are able to manufacture their own BT crystals, which will repel the caterpillars from eating them and basically acts as a built-in pesticide. Now we'll talk about the impact that GMOs can have on pesticide use. So in the case of BT corn, it's actually decreased the amount of pesticide that's used as we can see in the graph here. And that's because basically the corn is manufacturing its own insecticide. They're making these BT crystals within their cells and then the caterpillars or the other pests that try to eat the corn die and the corn is protected from the pest. So in the blue, we have insecticide use. In the green, we have the percent uh, of the acreage that has BT crops on it. And so as BT crop percentage is rising, we see insecticide is steadily going down. They have an inverse relationship. So the more BT corn we're planting, the less insecticide we're using on that BT corn. That makes sense because the insecticide is basically built in. So in this case, GMOs can decrease pesticide use. 
However, in the case of Roundup Ready crops, GMOs have actually increased herbicide use. And so in this case here, we can see in 1996, when Roundup Ready crops were introduced, we have a steady rise in the amount of herbicide that's used. And remember, that's because these crops are resistant to the herbicide glyphosate, which is a really broad category of herbicide. So since cotton, soybean, and corn have genes that allow them to resist Roundup, farmers can effectively douse their fields with it with no fear of harming their crops. And so that leads to them using more and more of the Roundup over the years. It's really effective at killing the weeds. It doesn't harm the crops, but there's a lot of unintended consequences. We'll get into that more when we get into our water pollution units. And lastly, today we'll talk about the impact of GMOs on genetic diversity. So GMOs are genetically modified organisms they are all genetically identical. They're essentially clones of each other. So they have zero genetic diversity. What this means is that there, if there is a disease or a pest that's able to harm these crops, they're in for catastrophic losses because they don't have any chance of having a genetic mutation in the population that can provide an adaptation that can be advantageous and help them survive. So they're essentially all going to die if there's one disease or pest that can affect them. Whereas if we have a diverse population, as we can see with this potato example here, this diverse crop uh, will have some organisms that are resistant and are able to survive the blight. However, in the cloned potato crop, in the crop that has genetically modified potatoes, they're all going to be genetic clones of one another. So they're all going to be susceptible to this potato blight. And so after the disease, effectively none of them survive. And so think of GMOs as kind of putting all of our eggs in one basket. We're hoping that that genetically modified crop doesn't fall victim to disease or to pest. If it does though, every single member of that population would be expected to suffer from that pest. On the other hand, crops that are not genetically modified, they have some genetic diversity. So there's the potential that some of the individuals can have a resistant gene and can survive that pest or that disease. Our practice FRQ for topic 5.6 today is to describe one economic advantage and one economic disadvantage of using genetically modified crops. All right, everybody, thanks for tuning in today. Don't forget to like this video if it was helpful, subscribe for future APES video updates, and check out other notes over here to the side. And as always, think like a mountain, write like a scholar. <laughs>